Uh, Joshua Poteet and Kathy Graber are just absolutely two terrific up-and-coming writers, both with first books out. Those books are for sale, by the way, in the lobby. If you love their work, support them, buy them. They'll be happy to sign them for you afterwards. I'm going to introduce both of them now so that I don't have to interrupt uh, once we really get into their, into their work. Kathy Graber is going to be reading first, and she joins the... Now, I have to apologize to you guys. I usually write these fancy things. I didn't write it today, um, so I'm just going to be given a, a little bit of information about each of you and then saying something about what I know about you. Kathy Graber is part of the expository writing program as a language lecturer at New York University. She has a BA in philosophy and an MFA in creative writing. Her focus is poetry. She's taught at Atlanta County Community College, way down at the other end of the state, the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and in the expository writing program now uh, where she is full time. She's re received fellowships from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the Rona Jaffe Foundation. Her poem, Topography, Pinelands, appeared in Painted Bride Quarterly, and that was actually the first poem of Kathy's that I ever saw. I knew her face, I knew her from uh, some of the circles that we both run in, but I ran across that poem and was just amazed at the craft and the skill in, in it, uh, and it turned me into a fan right then and there. Her first book has been published, I think you just got them in the mail within the last couple of days, by Saturnalia, and those who are in my poetry class who are reading Bob Hickok right now might be interested to know that Bob was the uh, judge for that. So her book Correspondence is brand new, fresh, it's got wet paint on it, and we're some of the first people maybe seeing it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the whole, reading the whole thing myself. Josh Pote, I first met a couple of years ago. He's a great guy, he's a terrific writer, a great deal of heart. He's won awards from the American Literary Review, River City, Nebraska Review, Marlboro Review, Columbia, Bellingham Review, a bunch of others, Catskill Poetry Workshop, which where I met him. He won the 2004 National Chapbook Fellowship from the Poetry Society of America. He has that here today with him, a few last copies that are available if anybody's interested in that. In 2001, he was the summer writer in residence at the University of Arizona's Poetry Center, and in 2002 was awarded an individual artist grant from the Virginia Commission for the Arts. His first full-length collection, Ornithologies, won the 2004 Anhinga Prize for Poetry. I think you're going to like both of these guys. When they're done, they'll be happy to answer. Uh, I'll bring um, Kathy back up, and they'll both be happy to answer any questions, maybe talk a little bit. So please welcome Kathleen Graber. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to meet Joshua Poteet, and I've known Laura for a long time, so I'm very happy that uh, she thought of me. And I'm happy to read for the very first time from the new book, which means I won't be able to find the poems, but I've <laughs> I've always seen people not be able to find the poems, and now I know what that feels like. That's, it's a good feeling. Um, there, I'm going to just read four poems, and I'm going to try to sort of position them so that you understand the function in the, in the book. There's a, a series of poems. There's a, several threads that run through. Um, one of the threads is a German literary critic named Walter Benjamin um, th that I've love very much and so there are some poems that are sort of response respond they respond to um, some of his most important essays and so the first poem that I'm going to read is one of those and it's named has the same title as his essay it's called the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction and it has uh, an epigraph from a Palestinian poet Taha Muhammad Ali trust me my happiness bears no relation to happiness at 30 a woman wants to have a child but she will never have one. Doctors will pump her empty belly with air, make the small incisions, put a camera in. More than once, she will drive a hundred miles with her husband's sperm in a glass vial warmed between her thighs and inject herself with hormones distilled from the urine of mares. Months in, months out, the twin engines of the ovaries work a follicular double time. The woman behind the counter at Unique Copy Center calls me baby. I'm not the kind of woman 
who'd call anybody baby. Not even the baby I never had. Baby, she asks, is this clear enough for you? You know, we can make these real high resolution if that's what you want. She's wearing a shiny pendant with the face of a little girl printed directly onto the disc. It looks like an archaic daguerreotype, although daguerre's prints on their polished silver surfaces were so much harder to see. What does Benjamin tell us about the aura of the authentic? It bears, he says, in its singularity, the terrible wear of its past. If I ever wanted a child, I wanted what I was taught to want. This is how we reread our lives. I read, I never wanted a child. You may read, I am only telling myself, I did not want what I could not have. But we have words. We recognize correspondence, conception, rationale, repair. One poet says, we need names. Every child must know all the birds in the yard. For what would we do if we did not know the names of the 10,000 things? Another says, when I go into the wood and see a flower I do not name, I'm sorry, I do not know, I consume it. I bring it into the womb of the mind where it can grow. And when it has grown, I bless it. I give it the name I think it should have. Cabinet de Mirage, Passage du Désir, Luna, Looking Glass. For Benjamin, the names are never merely signs. A woman in her 30s wanted a child. The woman in her 40s can barely recall her. Perhaps it's not words that fail, but memory, the amber ampule, the brittle bulb from which we struggle to extract the drug. Not memory that fails, but the needle of our grammar. I have no rhetoric for this woman I carry inside me. She had no syntax for the woman inside her. Daguerreotype, Sarkowski says, we must approach in private by lamplight because it is elusive, a secret, its case half closed. Take it in, trust me, the woman I am bears no relation to the woman I am. Uh, <clears throat> this is a small one from the back of the book. Um, in the summertime, I live in Wildwood, New Jersey. It's a really honky-tonk beach town. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then there's just a lot of open space. But in the wintertime, I live in Jersey City. Um, and it's a kind of really blighted urban landscape if you've ever been there. So this is sort of ironically called pastoral, and it's about Jersey City. <clears throat> All winter, I watched the cat in the butcher's window. And now that the weather has turned, the door to new con meats stands open. I catch the whine of the electric saw, the slap of the cleaver. But because the white-coated workers stand always with their back to the street, I never have to see what's being done. To keep ourselves together, we learn to keep ourselves apart. Etched in the ancient tomb of the Queen of Ur is the image of Capra Prisca, a ram caught in a thicket. We read the breed from the peculiar spiral of its horns. The indifferent gray cat, loyal only to the sc tough scraps from the master's block, slips out past two crates of mangoes into the warm air of the stoop. Last week, a man opened the battered back gate of an idling van and swung three flayed goats, even the heads were bare, across his shoulder, then stepped inside. The flesh was neither pink nor bloodied, but a dry, articulate bank of dark muscle and pale ribbons of fat. Imagine the first spring, the fine violet flank of night descending. Uh, this is the, the first poem in the book. Um, it's uh, a poem that is set riding the Long Island Railroad in Long Island. There's two towns, one's called Laurelton and one is called Locust Manor. Um, it's just your basic suburban 
development, a little Levittown-esque, I guess. And I, the train used to stop when I used to take that commute often and sort of just sit there waiting for, uh, I guess, the switch to change to go into um, Jamaica Station. Um, <clears throat> The only other thing I think you know, you some of you are so young you won't remember Ed Sullivan, a uh, variety show, but um, as a kid the highlight for me was he um, had, there was an Italian mouse hand puppet named Topo Gigio and they would uh, have their little skits together, so Topo Gigio makes an appearance here. Uh, between Laurelton and Locust Manor. The houses turn from the tracks and play instead nose to nose with their identical neighbors. The same old games. Who will blink first? Guess what I'm hiding behind my back? How long have they held the mower, the buried bone, the hubcap in their yards? Someone saving seven busted up rowboats a long way from the sea. Isn't this art the careful arrangement of what is useless? The way painting without mercy emerges on broken plates. Even if there were water, a flood, nothing here would float. Even from the train, we can tell a story about the epiphanic suffering of saints. Even from here, we can see the split wood, the violent gray gash in the bow, give them names, Lucy, patron of hide and seek, Sophia, martyr of the 20 questions. And this is where we stop, waiting for the signal from the station. It's a tired trope, a bright February. I've lost something I'll never find. This is about black and white television, about Ed Sullivan in earnest conversation with Topo Gigio, acting as though he didn't know there was a script, a human hand inside. I don't want to suggest the assemblagist's religion of junk because maybe it's simpler, the explanation for what's collecting beyond the fence, an ancient urge that rises up from the base of the skull and ferries us to the harvest of whatever we can. But I spy a red rowboat on sawhorses in the morning of every day. Somebody come tell me that's not a kind of faith. Somebody say that's not the kind of sign we should expect from a god. Last one. Uh, it's a little long. Um, there is a series of poems that are spread out throughout it. There's five of them. It's called Correspondence, and so these poems are called The Letters. Um, the conceit of the poem is a, a sort of impossible romance where these are my favorite kind. Nothing can possibly happen. It just goes on tortured forever. So um, this is the, this is the uh, MO of the speaker of these poems and is engaged in the process of sort of um, trying to forget about it, since it, nothing good can come. Um, each, one of the, uh, each one of the letters, they're called letters because they appropriate correspondence um, from famous writers. And this one appropriates the correspondence of the poet Larry Levis to Phil Levine. Um, I'm reading this because Josh Poteet studied with Larry Levis and I'm only a Larry Levis fan. Um, across distances. Um, it starts with, it's, uh, each, of the, each of the letters has a, it's a mnemonic. They're called, it's a mnemonic for forgetting. This one is E, is for elegies. And it has an epigraph from, from Larry Levis. The poet deliberately, skillfully, insouciantly, cunningly, faithfully, unforgivably forgets. It is the only kind of forgetting, which is also a form of remembering. One. Another pink evening, the tired calliope of the first ice cream truck churns away down a different block. And then, what I think must be the breath of a machine I cannot recognize, becomes a slender, imperfect V of geese honking north. Because just an hour before, there'd been a cardinal in a tree and a squall of starlings, the whole earth for a moment seems wing and flutter so that even the stones driven up against the cement stanchion at sunset appear to me impossibly round and fragile, expectant skin, as patient in their dirty nest of sand and wrappers as a pigeon's mislaid eggs. 
I'm not in love with anyone anymore, Levis writes in 83. But the form of stone is the form of attrition. It becomes itself through what is lost. The way tumbling a song on a jukebox quarter after quarter will make us blind to its music. Annihilation, we might call it, by a brutal adolescent affection. That other circuit to forgetting, as implausible as it might seem, the width of memory like a record's groove uninscribing itself with use. We, in the most threadbare hotel room in Missouri, when the light was out, too, were touch, and our bodies had the textures of wind. Last night, I forgot my keys on the back seat of the cab. I stood in the hall a long time, searching my pockets, the bottom of my bag. Yet when I rushed out, the driver was still there, logging the night's account into his ledger. Dumb luck, a thing to remember to be thankful for. How the small coincidence can sometimes make the late hours sweet. How it allows us to allow that there's still a little time to consider our mistakes, a minute for returning and undoing whatever it is we're so afraid we've done. Even in May, the dead are all around us, slipping between an overgrown hedge and an oak, walking home from the bay. I was stopped last week by the delicate, rigid body of a bird, its back precisely snuggled into the root lift, its legs thin as bass strings, pushed stiffly away from its mottled breast. What must have been a flecked and lovely flashing, almost weightless in the leaf shadow, a marsh wren maybe, that white streak across the crown. Three. I caught myself bending down to lift it, tempted just then to bring it home, without even pausing to wonder why or how or why again. And still, I half want to go back and find it, alive now, as I know it must be, in its belly with other lives, the dangerous, disturbing mechanics of decay. Maybe to be in love is to love something that passes, which speaks solemnly to you just once, which is like wind with its texture. I'd rather forget everything. Think of the airless silence before the armored grasshopper splits open and another grasshopper, ruthless, twice as big, steps out. Some animals grow at a steady rate and some by fits and starts. When I am pure of heart, maybe I write for a thoroughbred in the last furlong and for a sparrow huddled in the freezing rain. When I try to become deaf to what rustled between us, the thing that the wind always kept trying to tell us that it was, I imagine how I'll be, a dark, numinous flatness, like an unpressed disc, remarkable, but less, a creature half my size. Thank you. Hi there, thanks for coming. And hopefully most of you are getting extra credit for this. Um, and thanks to Laura for having us. It's very sweet of you to, to do this. It's not often you get to travel to different states to give readings. Um, I thought I would begin with a few half-ass sonnets. And it, it's a very specific art to do a half-ass sonnet. You have to be kind of an underachiever like me. and You don't shave very often. You kind of lay around a lot. Mm. <clears throat> These are from a series Meditations in the Margins of the Book of Irish Curses. And these are official Irish curses, um, official from the country of Ireland. And uh, this first one is entitled, In the Middle of the Field May Your Horse Kill You. Let it be a roan without foal, without a crown of honeybees circling her mane of clover. The tongue of a bee is golden and can never mourn the evening as it weaves through the river birches, Nyssa aquatica, named for the water that sweetens its touch, and Pinus palustris, longleaf pine, named for the palace of cinder above the river. Let it be the roan, please, without holiness or shame. May she throw my ribs to the graveyard clay and make a cake for my legs of broken air. May her tail coarse as an orphan's wrist 
sweep the bees into my mouth that will never taste a river again. How can the silence remain whole beneath the grass? May she never know how much I loved her. And this next one is, back from the river, back to the river, may savage dogs eat you one foot on a mountain. <clears throat> this is a landscape I once believed in. And because of belief, I've made it across the frozen river, the marshes torn apart by winter, to the disappearing rooms of the sea. Make me want it, this loveliest of air. Make the world another world, beneath the persimmon grove and the rain. I am not hated, and I am not lucky, but I know that when I leave a place, the rivers will not miss me. And if the owl and bat hunting among the persimmon briefly touch, talon, skin, wing, and leave me to myself, then pray the dogs feast on my gallant feet, for the mountain is burning, and I regret none of it. And how about this one? May you not see the cuckoo nor the corn crake, which means may not live to see the next spring. So it's always good to use this at the beginning of winter, so it has the, the curse gives time to kick in, you know? You get a little, anyway. It could be worse. On Attila the Hun's wedding night, he got so drunk he hemorrhaged from the nose and suffocated to death in his own blood. I'm not saying I want any of this. I've always considered myself a victim, though. Haven't you ever embarrassed yourself? It's embarrassing to live sometimes. I've touched a nest of wasps in the night just to get an idea of how the human flame is shaped, and a sparrow joined me. Yet I can't say birds aren't grateful for such a chance there in the darkness that only the leaves own. I'm living is what this means. Maybe you've noticed the tiny hearts have gathered in the trees. Um, maybe this guy right here. Um, it's called May God Weaken You. And there's an epigraph from George Trockel. There is a light that fails in my mouth. I have seen my face in an autopsy photo Adrift in the shroud of 1910. This light is so much like you, I tell myself, under the alcohol lamps and bone curettes. Now a cadaver, I can see what it means to be honey in a tobacco pouch, the skin of God in a firefly's gut. The star's grand indifference is not enough anymore, that falseness of freedoms. I want to fall in the ice of a frozen river and see the grasses swaying in the current beneath. I want to uncork the ether jars and wash the moths from the apothecary's wooden bedpan. Remember when we were the only ones alive, dear surgeons? The century neglected, witnessed our passing, our cursed days. There we were, weakened and lost among the tourniquets, the amputated legs of night graceful in the wind and in the flesh and in the poorest dawn. I have a problem with stealing things, mainly just titles. I kind of gave up on stealing other stuff a long time ago. I used to steal books from other bookstores that are national chains and not independent stores. <laughs> um, so I take titles and things and I just, I don't know if it's a riff on them. It's not really jazz or anything. It's just that's what I do, because I'm an underachiever, I guess. I can't work enough on my own to make my own titles, which is a fault. And I'm going to read a couple from the series, from the 1941 catalog of Dover books. So these are titles of books that Dover put out back in the day. And this first one is called Uniforms of the American Revolution Coloring Book. I apologize on behalf of the dead. They do not mean to hurt us. They show us a way to be in the world, then leave us for the deer and salt licks, the reed-shrouded fog and the marsh. I knew a dead person once, and I considered myself lucky. To wear the ghost of him like an untanned bear hide brought me a secret pleasure I have not felt since. Who needs lungs when you're flying among the trees? It's what the taxidermists all say. We construct the infinite spirit, and you ignore the palpable soul. Think of it. To wear the uniform of the dead is to walk through mountains. Show me the way to the doorless sea, to the river of brine and day, and I'll give you hands to breathe again, lads, the most important things you'll need to cradle this land that will never be yours. 
And this one is called String Figures and How to Make Them. You know, string figures, you make shapes from string. And um, long, long ago, it was made from sinew and other parts of animals. So this is string figures and how to make them. Bend the rind of an orange, the Inuit say, and you will see its true breath darting into the cold world. They call the orange Eye of God and believe that it lives with the eels among the bloody waters. Not anymore, of course. It is only an orange now. Eventually, truth gives up its names and settles down for the evening with a smoke and a beer. I've learned this much. In November, you begin to know how long the winter will be and that the evening is rather a lonesome place. The first snow turns blue and sighs against the birches, the black willows, as it should. There's nothing else to see and we move on. The truth comes to me only when I'm alone. But even then, it's hard to tell what is truth and what is the ash and light through storm clouds. I never learned much about the Inuit, seal skin, whalebone, the myth of the 100 names for snow. It all seemed unreal, too close to a pure solitude I would never feel in my life. But imagine their first taste of that other world years ago after the American freighter sank, a lifeboat filled with oranges, the only survivors. Imagine what one orange could do to such a solitude that calm, silent truth of froth and rhyme. Then imagine a boat full of oranges, a radiance unlike anything they had ever seen upon the sea, a gift from the eyes of God, and the children playing string figures on the shore, calling sinew into names, cat's cradle, moving spear, lightning, stars. And I think I'll read a couple of <clears throat> southern poems. I'm from the South, and I grew up there, and I live in the capital of the Confederacy, which no longer exists, if you can believe it, because living in Richmond, you can kind of forget that it, you know. And on this poem uh, involves a few statues in Richmond. There's a lot of general, Confederate generals on this avenue called Monument Avenue. There's many statues, and Robert E. Lee is one of them, Jeb Stewart, uh, yeah. And the river I'm speaking of is the James River, which flows through Richmond. This is called Nocturne for the river. I can't bear to be forgotten by any more people. And walking home under these anonymous street lamps, it would be easy to slip under the cobblestones and sleep away the nights, comfortable and alone. Even the street lamps have forgotten me, forgotten how to give their light. The sickly powder orange of a child's mouth full of aspirin is all they can muster now. It's sad, yes, but it's also a little too participatory. There's no avoiding them, no resemblance to the living, to the morning light they mimic. There's a Buddhist proverb, participate joyfully in the sorrows of the world, and I've tried, believe me, smiling the pink smile of a lamb, a quarter in a blind girl's cup, but doesn't mean to breathe in this airy version of asbestos or to keep walking these streets, smashing each light to reclaim some small hidden memento from a time when there was hope. Tonight, a south wind brings me the scent of the tobacco plant across the river, and the bread factory a few blocks away has given up its loaves to the air, which redeems us in a way, I think, for redemption is nothing more than a breaded wind pulling a, pulling a night from frailty. Tell me, Robert E. Lee, of the hundred years sleep, of mice skulls and owl dung, your bronze head bearing the weight of catacombs hidden in the itch of amputees, gaslit, forlorn. Tell me, Jeb Stewart, that everything will be okay, that your horse is facing north because she misses the snowy fields. Tell me, sad horse, with doves nesting under your raised hoof, in this century of longing, how can I go on loving this ruined excuse for a city? Sleepy sweet night, sweet cicada, sweet oak, sweet old nothing. Sad-eyed Matthew Brady, come down to me from your glass-plated heaven of iodine, from your tent city of wagons in a muddy field where my apartment building now stands. Years of smoke rising between us, and watch the reflection of crows roost far below the water in the tulip trees, as Whitman did once after the war. From a skiff in the shallows of the James, pale gold, the play of light coming and going, bats and thrushes alive with stars woven over the musical trees and over the past, over the milky blossoms of wild carrot or oblivion. 
And so, like the river in the distance humming the trestle song of night trains, its skin seeming to hold twilight, delay it, I stand among these street lamps a forgotten man and let the South's last summer rise up and consume me. And this last guy is also a nocturne and kind of, uh, it's a story that I've heard once a long time ago. So the speaker in this poem is not me. And it also takes place in the South and General Lee appears again. And I apologize because I'm not really pro-South, but it keeps popping up. Mm, yeah, this is called Nocturne for the night workers of the South. Once when I was young and loved every girl that breathed the same summer air as me, I worked as a night watchman in the county asylum, a forgotten place, lost among the kudzu, the long-leaf pines birthing cones the size of watermelons. It was the kind of place that when it rained, spotted moth larvae would tunnel from the wet plaster ceilings and drink the patient's ears. The county wanted it forgotten, their own kind gone bad, like in the Bible where Christ slaps rotting eggs from the yellow mouths of lepers. Eat of this bread, he said, or something close, and the lepers scraped up the eggs and made a sandwich, and I imagined for the first time Christ shrugged. You are what you eat, he should have said, if he had any truth left in him by then. I wasn't allowed to talk to the patients, and usually they were all medicated by the time I hitched a ride there, on the backs of flatbeds wedged between crates of sweet potatoes rotting under the moon. When I found out that I wasn't really a night watchman, but an owl catcher, I would have to incinerate any owl I caught. I stayed on anyway. I needed the work. According to legend, seeing a horned owl during a meal was supposed to mean, don't finish your stew. Barn owls seen more than a mile or so from their perches were wandering ghosts, or meant that ghosts would soon, would soon force themselves into your dreams, a madness I could do without. Sighting a snowy owl meant that bones would ache, but without further consequence. They would simply ache for a while, then stop. I found this applied for all owls. My whole body ached then. When I dressed for work, it was like dressing a wound. I couldn't tell if it was the girls or the birds. I became good at it though, despite the ache, if that is even possible. Chewing the stolen orange meat of potatoes to keep me awake, slumped in the attics with a canvas bag from the laundry room. Christ also said, any true work is done alone. This I believe. The sweat of the insane is sweeter than ours, clover and bees wing and honeyed ham. I could hear them breathing beneath me in their beds. Don't ask how it was to be so near that bleak sea of faces. It's the faces, paint flaking off, dolls with blinking eyes, snow of paint and spilled urine. Even their breath, eight petaled in the chill of their rooms, was something I couldn't name. Dogwood, no. Wild pea, perhaps, but no. Chamomile, milkweed, never. I never looked at them, the pink azalea of hair between their legs, luminous with lice not even down the blouses of the nurses when they bent to look in at the big-headed owls. Now I think I brought those birds down through the wards, alive and flapping, was so someone would stop me. No one ever gets tired of the moon. No one ever said, fuck the moon, let's get it out of here. We keep it around, we learn to like it. Habit is the devil's glorious invention, like I heard war could be. Easing a bayonet into a belly was the same as opening a can of tomatoes by firelight if you did it enough. These were birds and I burned them, and on rare days I remembered their heads, round and milky, baby's breath, their wings not really wings finally, but damp bolts of silk, and the low sough of wind dragging their rashes into September's arms. I remember the story of General Lee on his deathbed, telling a sad friend to cheer up, that he had known but three happy hours during his whole existence, two of those as a child asleep in the boughs of a white oak, the last in an asylum staring at a beautiful girl's naked ribcage that had been woven into a basket by tuberculosis. Night transcends what the proudest day can do, that's for damn sure, all silently, the indescribable night and stars far off and silently. Thanks.